All right. Well, welcome. I got a couple new faces. I think there's at least two new faces in here. Three. I don't know. Yeah. I know you're related, so. Related to the speaker, so. All right, well, welcome to the museum. I'd like to thank everybody for coming. I, I was kind of wondering what was going to happen today with the 60 degree weather, but the, uh, everybody, yeah, everybody got blown to the beach. They stepped out of their house and blew them into the lake. Uh, well, welcome. I'm glad you all could make it. Uh, I think the, this is our, uh, this is our first lecture that's actually has not been canceled in a while. So hopefully that it becomes a trend. So, uh, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the, uh, our system, we don't charge admission for our lectures. There's a gray donation box outside the door. Please, uh, you know, throw throw a hundred thousand million bucks in there, whatever whatever you got laying in here, whatever kind of walking around money you got. Uh, when the lecture's over, feel free to check out the museum. We also have the used book sale going on all the way into the back and to the left. We have way too many books, so please buy a box or two and take them home with you. Uh, so, I guess. Uh, we got going on. So we got a couple of things coming up. Uh, uh, the next uh, event we have here would be on March 19th. We're going to be doing our our walk through history, is what we call it, our living history. Uh, it'll be an indoor event. Uh, for in uh, so we'll have uh, reenactors from various eras uh, scattered around the museum, uh, tied into some of the exhibits that we have. So that'll be March 19th all day. Uh, the next day on March 20th. Uh, we will have well, one of the lectures that was canceled that is rescheduled is going to be uh, behind the scenes building the big three with Ford Durant and Chrysler. Uh, it's by Russell Lee Dorr. I, it's a uh, he's going to be doing a book signing and lecture about his book. It is a it's a fact or fact based fiction work. So come and check that out. And then on April third. Uh, we will have Becoming the Motor City, a timeline of Detroit's auto industry by uh, Paul Vachon. Vachon. I don't know how to pronounce his last name, so forgive me if I butchered that. Uh, so that will probably be the last of our lectures for the for this for this this season. Uh, after that, we will be going right into uh, the next things that we have on the schedule officially right now are our three reenactment events at uh, Chesterfield, uh, which will be. Uh, well, I, I take that back. May 28th, we have a walk through history scheduled. Weather permitting will be outside. And then we have our three events in Chesterfield. Uh, June 4th and 5th will be the timeline, which is uh, basically 1600s through, through today. Uh, in July 23rd and 24th will be the World War II reenactment. And August 13th and 14th will be the Vietnam reenactment. So that those are the things we have scheduled right now. Uh, there are copies of the schedule out there on the table. Uh, there are also copies of our membership forms. If you're not a member, please think about grabbing one of those. So I guess without any further delay, I will turn the, the microphone over to Phil, who's going to be talking about uh, Civilian Conservation Corps veteran, Veterans in the Woods. Well, hello. Let's see if I can. Now can you hear me? Okay. Uh, first of all, I want to apologize. I was expecting to get about 900 pages of documents on the veteran camps from the National Archives, and I haven't gotten them yet. Uh, it was going to be able to give me some more detailed information on each of the seven companies uh, that were raised here in Michigan, uh, but I didn't get that. So a lot of the information that I have that's more specific and detailed is going to be on the camp that I've been researching, I don't know, three or four years now. Uh, Company V1670 that was at Clear Lake, Camp Presque Isle, um, up by Onaway, Michigan, Atlanta, Michigan area. Uh, but anyway, uh, I suppose you've all heard of the CCC, right? You young people, Bill, never heard of them before? Oh, okay. Um, of all, in my opinion, of all of Roosevelt's New Deal programs, outside of the Works Progress Administration, where there's still some high school football stadiums that were built by them. Uh, we have an outdoor rec center on Mill Lake in the Waterloo Recreation Area, Waterloo Pinckney Recreation Area, that was built by the WPA. There's not a lot left over from these alphabet programs, um, but the CCC was the most prolific. 
There's not a single state, not a single territory. Uh, Alaska, Hawaii were territories at the time. They had the CCC, uh, Puerto Rico, uh, as well as what they called the Indian camps that were CCC companies, but they were administered by the uh, uh, Indian Affairs Bureau. Now, when the CCC was first started, it's, it's, it's just amazing how quickly this took place. When Roosevelt first took office, they had his what they call the first 100 days, where just a ton of things were accomplished. Um, he met with the heads of uh, Department of Labor, Department of Agriculture, Department of the Interior, and the Department of the Army, and he brought up, I want to institute something similar to what we did in New York when I was governor, and that's to make a civilian conservation corps, and this is what I envision. And he says, I want to put this into effect almost immediately. And the first person he went to is the Secretary of the Army. He says, can you do this? And without batting an eye, the Secretary of, of, Secretary of War, excuse me, not Secretary of the Army, Secretary of War said, absolutely, we could do this starting next, tomorrow. And the reason why they did that is somebody had proposed a bill, a senator from Michigan proposed a bill to house unemployed youth at Army camps that were not being used, like Camp Custer, a lot of empty barracks there. It'd be a someplace safe there, you know, the army would feed and clothe them, but there was really no program involved with it. And that bill was defeated, but the army had already done the study on that. What, what do we need to do to put this in place? And that was for only 80,000 people nationwide. So with, with that kind of enthusiasm for it, they, they pushed the bill through. Uh, it passed on March 31st. Uh, by April 2nd, they already had the first enrollment in Virginia. That's how fast this went into place. Uh, I can't remember what the strength of the regular army was in 1933. Do you recall? It wasn't much. It was like maybe 100,000, maybe if. if. Um, within three months, there was 275,000 men enrolled in the CCC. It is the fastest peacetime, or actually the fastest peacetime or wartime mobilization in U.S. history. It went faster than the mobilization in, in World War I. Uh, the thing was, originally, it was just for men 18. They, they call them CCC boys. There were no boys really officially enrolled in the CCC. You had to be 18 to 25. There were a lot of 15-year-olds that passed for 18-year-olds, and they said, okay, we'll let you in. Um, so they're noticing that, okay, we're getting enrollments. We're getting a lot of people referred to. You had to be on public welfare, which at that time, there was no national welfare. You're getting money from the county. Uh, contrary to what popular belief is nowadays, this was not uh, a time where Roosevelt was handing out money to everybody. If you got any form of government check from the WPA or the CCC or the earlier NERA program, uh, you had to work for it. There was no handout of welfare under the Roosevelt administration. You had to work for it. Well, they started thinking is what's going to happen when we send a bunch of army personnel? Not a lot. Initially, there was, what, seven regular army personnel at each of these camps. A commanding officer, uh, two lieutenants. Normally, one of the lieutenants was a medical officer. And then they had uh, an acting first sergeant, acting supply sergeant, uh, acting mess sergeant, and a cook. That was it. And after the first six months, they left and reserve officers went in and all the supply people, all that were all enrollees. Well, you get all these people coming from out of state in some cases, like in the Ninth Corps area in California, uh, Washington. There's nobody local there. They were, they, there was such a low population density out there. They're pulling people from Kentucky, Ohio, uh, Vermont, New York, and sending them out there. So how do you think the locals felt with that? They weren't too happy, right? So how do you keep the locals happy? You hire 16 local experienced men to work at camp, to work under the camp foremans, which were usually uh, national parks, forest service, or state conservation department um, technical personnel. You hire these locals because if you hired the locals, that means somebody local got a job, right? In addition to the roughly $5,000 a month each camp spent on the local economy. 
So that kept them happy. And the reason for doing that was one, it did keep the locals happy, but it also kept them from starting forest fires. Because in the 30s, before the CCC, a good way to get money if you're an unemployed logger was go start in a forest fire. Because then they come into town, the Forest Service and the state conservation departments would come out and say, we're going to give you $1.75 a day or a dollar a day to help fight fires. <laughs> so it, it kind of cut down on the amounts of forest fires that were happening. But then again, those guys were allowed to be married because they were locals. The enrollees themselves, you, you had to be unmarried. And again, 18 to 25 years old, you're paid $1 a day. If you're a regular enrollee, $30 a month, $25 of that was sent home so your family could eat. Keep in mind, a loaf of bread was five cents, a pound of ground beef was 12 cents. $25 bought a lot of groceries for a family. Uh, the enrollee was allowed to keep five, and out of that, every month for the normal enrollment period, it was 50 cents a month. He bought his foot locker. He had to buy the foot locker. Um, but the rest of that was used for buying toiletries, cigarettes, um, pop, things like that, or, or going into town to see movies. So it wasn't a lot of money. And you got to keep in mind, an infantry private in the Army made $18 a month. So it was, it was a lot of money, but it wasn't. A dollar a day, basically. Uh, but what do you do with all these other unemployed people? Well, again, some of them could have gotten hired as LEMS. Uh, some people that may have had some ex uh, construction experience, um, bridge building, road work, things like that, they would be hired on by what they call the supervising agency. Um, in many cases, it would be the National Park Service, uh, the U.S. Forest Service, the Soil Conservation Service, uh, Bureau of Land Management, uh, the Biological survey, um, they actually ran a camp up at, at Germfask in Michigan. Um, they could be hired as foremen in the camp. But then again, you also have to remember under Hoover, you had the bonus army, right? All these World War I vets that were promised a bonus, and I think it was in 1923. They didn't get it. You know, they, Hoover sent in MacArthur and the army and six tanks to kick them out of Washington and burn down their camps. What's not known is, is that after Roosevelt got elected, there was another smaller march on Washington in May. Well, when they had these guys come in, they sent them up at Camp Hunt in Virginia, and the Army paid for their food and put them in tents, kind of kept it all nice and quiet. He wasn't going to do what they did before with these bonus Army guys. And then uh, I think it was the Secretary of Labor went up to Roosevelt and he said, you got all these unemployed World War I vets, you know? They want that money now, that bonus money. Why don't you put them in the CCC? So in early May of 33, they agreed to enroll 25,000 uh, war vets. The majority of them were World War I vets, but some of them dated back to the Spanish War. Uh, the oldest guy in camp, or actually the first guy to get, die in camp, uh, Presquil, the company I've done the most research on, he had a stroke and he was a Spanish war vet. He was 60 years old, and he wasn't the oldest guy in camp. That was Pop Briggs. He was 61. And when I get to a picture of that company, these guys look like they're 80. They led a hard life. So they said they're going to enroll that 25,000 initially nationwide. And what they actually did is they enrolled 28,000. They bent a few rules. Nothing's ever set in stone with the CCC. The more you research it, the more you find out. This was the standard, but they did do this here or there. Um, and also all the, all the uh, districts, they're operated out of, again, they're run by the army, the camps themselves were. But the army had no responsibility for the projects that they did in the force. That was the supervising agency. And as I mentioned earlier, forest service, park service, uh, state conservation departments, um, bureau of land management, uh, they they ran the project. So it was a dual responsibility in the camp. The Army was really just responsible for the buildings, camp buildings, the food, the clothing, the supply, things like that. Um, they didn't even supply trucks. Now, the CCC, and officially it wasn't the CCC until 1937. It was actually the ECW, Emergency 
conservation work program. Uh, they funded all the purchases for the vehicles, the tools that the supervising agencies uh, provided the, the enrollees of the camps to work with. It was paid for by the ECWCCC, but the camps didn't operate that. That was so the garages, the blacksmith shop, everything that you find in the camp for that type of work, that was all run by the supervising agency. Um, a lot of people were fearful of the army in the 30s. They thought that they're going to militarize these guys and give them military training, you know, because Nazi Germany was starting to have a very similar program um, where they were actually training these kids to be in the army. Now, in Michigan, we ended up with seven camps. Uh, five of them lasted a fairly long time. Two of them I know lasted the entire nine years. And again, that's some of the information I'm lacking in because I haven't gotten those documents from NARA. Um, the first one that went out, uh, went out in 33, and that is the 16th, 70th. Uh, but that was not the first camp in Michigan. And let's see if I can get this going on here. So what you have here is these are the camps. I don't know, is there any way to blow this map up or increase the size of this picture? The majority of the veteran camps, well, all the veteran camps were in the southern or the lower peninsula. Let's see if we can get this going. Oh, yeah. Uh, back up, back up. This is right up a little bit more, back a little bit more smaller. I got to get, see, just above this area. Oh, oh there you go. Okay. Yeah, one more down. Yeah, there's one up just north of here. A little smaller. Okay, there you go. Perfect. All right, so Crestiel was the first one. That's uh, company 1670. Then Black Lake, Pigeon River, Vanderbilt, Johannesburg, Bay City, Saginaw, and then down in, in uh, Waterloo Rec area, there was a camp for five months in 1935 by the company that ended up in Bay City. Um, it was just a tent camp. They built the Portage Lake uh, campground. Now, at that time, Portage Lake was a state project, and then in 1947, that was taken over by the Waterloo Recreation Area. That was a state park that they just got from the National Park Service because when Camp Waterloo opened up in Waterloo, that was a national <laughs> park project. It was an RDA, Recreational Development Area. But anyway, so you had the camp here, two in Bay City, Bay City and Saginaw, and then eventually the company from Bay, uh, Saginaw ended up at uh, here in Marquette, Ludington. And they finished off a lot of the projects that were uh, started there by the what they call the junior company, which is the younger guys, 18 to 25. Um, the, pardon me? You, what was there at Houghton Lake, uh, what you see at Houghton Lake is the actually the Houghton Lake Nursery. That's not a CCC camp. It was worked on by the CCC camp. So you have or excuse me, Houghton Lake, you have, uh, no, Houghton Lake would have been Ross Common, Camp Ross Common. Higgins Lake, this is where the camp is, but they actually work here. The actual Higgins Lake CCC camp is four miles northeast of the CCC Museum and Nursery Museum. But that, that camp here was not a veterans camp. The, you see all these camps here? These are all junior, what they call junior camps. So you have Black Lake, Hawks was a, a very short-lived one also that worked on uh, Half State Park. Hawks, they ended up going to Saginaw. Uh, they were only there for about five months. But Black Lake, the, the, per, the semi-permanent ones were Black Lake, Crestville, Pigeon River, Vanderbilt, Johannesburg, Bay City, Saginaw, and Pier Marquette. And Pier Marquette, also the veteran company there, sent a side camp up and they built Orchard Beach State Park. You remember a few years ago, they moved that big stone pavilion there. State spent millions moving it because it was gonna fall off the cliff. That was built by veterans. I'm talking guys in their 50s built that structure. 
Now, the other camp that was occupied briefly uh, by veterans was also Camp Osabo, which is just uh, east of Hartwick Pines. The camp at, uh, let's see here, where are they? Johannesburg was company 1671, and they didn't start out there. Their first summer in 33, they were actually on Mackinac Island. They did that, did that for two years at Mackinac Island, but they didn't spend the winters there. They came down for their winters at Bay City, and then they'd go back up during the summer to work there. That was a tent camp with only a few permanent structures, and I don't know exactly where on Mackinac Island that was. I haven't been up to Mackinac Island in several years. So they went back and forth for a few years, and then they ended up at uh, Johannesburg. And then later on in 35, they were broken up. A lot of the men uh, were sent up to Camp Presquil. They got, I think, 40 of the men. The rest of them formed a cadre for a new company that ended up going down to Saginaw. It's very weird how the CCC worked. Why wouldn't they just kept that company and sent them down to Camp Saginaw? They, they sent a whole new company built on a cadre of guys from Camp Vanderbilt. It gets, like I said, there's, there's a standard thing with the CCC, but then there's all these weird little things that happen that you wouldn't expect to happen. Now, the majority of these, you up in here, there's two in the Pigeon River country uh, state forest. That was called the Big Wild. That was like completely, completely timbered out. It was a wasteland. If you go into the Huron Forest over here by Alpena and Mac Lake and Glenny, these are uh, junior companies. When they moved in there, it was like a desert. And they literally called it the Gobi Desert. Because that's when, uh, oh, what's his name, was out in the Gobi Desert finding the dinosaur eggs. It was a very popular term at the time. You have to remember, Michigan was pretty much, all our good timber was gone. And that land went to waste. You had forest fires and the soil was being blown away by the wind. And that's why one of the big projects of the CCC was reforestation. And out of all the states, Michigan actually uh, led, Michigan actually led all the states in how many trees we planted. Now you remember Oregon, Northern California, and um, Washington State were also uh, timbered out, but not to such a large degree. Michigan planted 484 million trees. That's more than an average of five other states ever did at that time. Uh, we averaged 57 camps a year in total. And for the majority of the time, we had seven veteran camps. But then after 37, we were down to five. Now, what types of work did they do? Let's see here. I can get this to... Oh, you gotta shrink it back, eh? All right. Skip that. So camp construction, again, when they first moved in, in 34, 33, 34, 35, not all the camps were constructed. So when the enrollees arrived, they were dumped off in a truck in a cleared out area and they had to erect tents. And then they were doing their forestation pro or forestry projects at the same time. But eventually they were building barracks. So generally by night, uh, November, mid-November of 1933, most of the original camps not, then went to barracks construction. This is Camp Presqu'ile, the 1670th company. And Clear Lake is to the right. And what you're looking at here is if you stand at the pavilion at Clear Lake, and you look out, that's the parking lot. There's very few traces left. I just spoke with the uh, park supervisor there, and I've been walking around trying to figure out where these buildings were, and he says, well, they're all buried. Um, you can see some of the stonework 
you don't see it in this picture. This was taken in uh, November of 33. Uh, they, stone, they lined pathways with stone. You can still see some of that. But pretty much the only foundations that are left are to the left of this picture across the road that gets you into the park. And that's where the garage was. <laughs> you, you follow that little pathway that goes straight up between those buildings to where the trees are. That's where you enter the, the day use area. And right there is, this is just to the right of the pavilion. So this area originally had the road that led into camp. That's been changed now too. That doesn't exist anymore. But they erected the sign there. And of course they put company 4612 there. 4612 was only there for a year and a half. Um, the company that built this camp was there for seven years. I, I don't like that sign. <laughs> And these are the uh, Series 700 Quartermaster Temporary Building Designs. This is from the 1930 uh, Army Quartermaster's Manual. And this is a standard 100-man barracks. Uh, this was adapted. Uh, the CCC camp usually had five barracks holding 40 men each. It was kind of much the standard. But you can see all these plans were adaptable. You can make this a 30-man barracks if you wanted to or make it as big as 100 men. Now, this is uh, the veterans of 1670. In uh, late November, they moved in on November 11th. And the reason why I know when this picture was taken, because they got their stoves in December of 1933. And you notice their stoves in the barracks, but those are for their pyramid tents. They took a wood-burning tent stove and use them temporarily. And these are, this is a, a junior company, but you can see how they eventually would have gotten the standard barrack stoves. Some of them would have been the round cast iron stoves, but a lot of them were more the uh, horizontal type. They generally had a man in the winter that his sole job as an enrollee, and you gotta remember Michigan winters are like eight months, especially up north. His sole job was walking around to each of the barracks and the dispensary and the mess hall feeding wood into the stoves to keep them warm. Uh, up in the tip of the thumb, the winters averaged about minus 20 degrees every day. This is another aerial view. This is, uh, was taken when this was a junior camp. This is Camp Higgins Lake. So the guys that lived here, the junior companies that lived here worked at the nursery at Higgins Lake. Um, and I want you to take a close look. I don't have the, uh, a modern aerial shot on this thumb drive, but this road is still there. This road is still, this is now known as CCC Camp Road. This is a little dirt track that goes into an open field. And this is all wooded. This building here, look where my pointer is here. And that's where I'm standing right now in this. The last company to occupy this uh, for just a little over a year was the 1670th company. They were the last company. Generally, when the program started drawing down, the last uh, camps to be closed were the veteran camps because they didn't need the jobs. The younger guys were going in the Army at this point in, in 42. The veterans, not necessarily, although in the collection here, we have a guy's uh, registration card, right? for World War II, and he was a World War I vet. And he was, he was with the 1670th company, which is kind of interesting. But you can see how it's all overgrown. Now, if you walk off to the left of this picture and you go in further than I've ever gone, you, the foundations for a lot of the barracks are still there. But that was the whole thing. These camps were all temporary. The buildings were designed to be knocked down, moved and reused. Uh, many after 1942, were just sold off to local farmers and they'd use them as tractor storage sheds, things like that. Um, the last building that was left at Camp Clear Lake or uh, Camp Presqu'ila on Clear Lake um, is now part of the VFW Hall in Atlanta. And I walked around that building. I don't know where it is in that building. I think they've recovered it a couple of times. This is the standard mess hall. Uh, everything again was quartermaster issue, all their clothing, uh, 
the barracks were quartermaster. Everything was run by the army and, and to army specifications. The discipline was not like the army. They couldn't you know, throw you in jail. They, they couldn't uh, court-martial you. The most they could do is fine you $3 or discharge you. And the biggest thing that scared an enrollee that was messing up was getting discharged and sent home. Because then he had to tell his parents, you're not getting that money anymore. So it's the standard crockery and everything from the Army. This is a, not a, a, a camp cook. This is someone doing KP at uh, Camp Presqueel. And they're wearing the standard Army bakers and cooks uniform. And these are some of the standard quartermaster. You have a, the water pitcher, meat platter, vinegar cruet, mustard pot, sugar bowl, syrup, the bowl, plate, this is a soup plate, the cup unhandled, a gravy pitcher, and a, uh, they call it a pickle tray. Now all of these in this picture, these are actually a friend out in Washington. He has more than I do. I have some CCC marked ones, but all of these are standard army with standard USQMC codes on them, with the exception of early ones had ECF in the code, then ECW, then CCC, and then CIV. Standard Army codes in that three-letter code in the standard code just said what fund paid for it. And like the Army, you did KP. These are some enrollees. These are junior enrollees. I, again, I have to apologize. I'm very limited on how many photos I have currently and what I might get from the National Archives. But all the work that's done is the exact same. The veterans did the same projects juniors did. A lot of reforestation, blister, rust control, things like that, <laughs> building roads, building bridges, fire trails, laying down phone lines, things like that. And what they're doing here is they're, they're putting on a new spring set to an army cot folding steel. The museum has one out here. That's the standard army ambulance. Do you remember what that's called? Something C-27. It's not, this was replaced by the Dodge uh, half ton later on. That's their dispensary. Each camp had its own dispensary. If they did not have an army doctor, they would have a local contract doctor. And two of the enrollees, whether junior or veteran camps, uh, were trained to do basic first aid and basic pharmacy work. Uh, the veteran camps were probably a little bit better off because a lot of these guys are war vets. Um, the man that was the, uh, the lead of the two uh, medical orderlies at Camp Presqueel was actually a discharged Navy first class pharmacist mate. So he probably knew as much as some of the doctors probably. <laughs> But they're very, very well off. And they, they redid this entire dispensary in 35 so they could open the windows and they'd look out on the lake. Each camp also had their own canteen where you could spend that $5 a month. Now, unlike the juniors, the veterans were allowed to be married. Remember, these, were, these weren't just kids that never had a job. These veterans, some of them were lawyers, stockbrokers, accountants, Insurance salesmen, bank clerks, they lost their jobs. And a lot of places who was hiring, they might hire somebody a little younger. So this was their salvation in a way. But they only had to send home $2,250 if, if they had dependents. If they had no children and no spouse, they got to keep all of their money. But they couldn't spend it all. 2250 had to go into a, an account that the Army set up for them. They'd get all their money back on discharge. But you can see some of the things that they're selling. Uh, Hershey bars, cigarettes. Uh, these are I think these are baby roosts. I can't remember what these are. Stationary, ties, bandanas. Uh, you can buy beer. If you're a junior camp, depended on your company commander if you did that. But all the veteran camps sold beer. No elk, no uh, liquor. Pardon me? Pardon me? Depends on where, where you're from. I mean, Camp Wayne, they didn't get beer. It was a junior company. 
but you know, anywhere in Southeast Michigan that you could get Strohs. Because the one picture I have, I think it's in here, I'm not sure. Okay, there's your typical classroom. Classes were all voluntary, but each camp had an educational advisor, read unemployed school teacher that would teach classes. Uh, let's see, Michigan, I think, had 8,000 get their eighth grade certificates, juniors, not, not the uh, volunteers, but 8,000 enrollees in the nine years of the CCC in Michigan got their eighth grade education completed in these camps. U of M and Michigan State also offered uh, extension classes to work on a college degree. There's your rec uh, kind of a standard recreation hall. It was a lot of times it was combined. The recreation hall would also have the educational area at one end, rec hall, and then you can see over here, back here, there's their canteen, little tables. You know, you could buy snacks and things there, toiletries. There's another library. Uh, depending on where you were, you know, what types of books that there was a standard. I think it was a standard 40 book library that was supplied by the army. The army also issued each camp uh, sporting goods, tennis rackets, badminton sets, volleyball nets, uh, horseshoes, baseball, football equipment. I don't know if any of them had a hockey team. I'm assuming up in the UP, they might've done that. And some of these camps actually, they really started sprucing up their buildings. You notice all the rugs, the tables, the army didn't buy those. The enrollees did. How did they do that? The funds from the canteen. They were sold at a minimal profit, enough to buy the same things to replace it. Anything left over went into the company fund. And that company fund was used to buy more books, tables, chairs, things like that for the comfort of the camp. And the Army operated on the same system. Their day rooms, that wasn't supplied by the Army. That came out of company funds. Now, this is uh, the 1670th company. This was taken in early June of 1935. And I was able to tell the uh, State CCC Museum when this picture was taken based on who's listed in here. There's an extra captain in here that was there for about 30 days to learn how to run a CCC camp. He trained under Captain Austin up top. Um, not only that, but it still has black and rollies in it. Michigan had integrated camps up through August of 1935 when they finally said you had to desegregate or uh, segregate your camps. They were never integrated in the South, but in the Northern states they were. But enough of the politicians down South in Roosevelt's own party said, we don't want that. So they finally segregated all the camps. Um, I think 1670th company started 1935 with, uh, I think, 35 to 45, what they call colored enrollees. And if you look at, the, you can't really see it. Close up with this guy right here. He looks like he's 80, 90 years old. This is the basic uh, structure of a CCC company for the camp itself, which was known as company overhead, and then the work section that went out and did the field work. So the senior leader was a rating. You had your basic enrollees. They're the ones that got $30 a month. You had assistant leaders that got a little bit more pay, and then senior leaders got $36 a month or excuse me, 40, $45 a month. Junior, junior leaders got $36 a month. So the supply steward, senior leader, mess steward, and there's an exchange steward and a company clerk. They made a little bit more money, but they never left the camp. These were administrative people. And then you went down to the special barracks, barrack leaders and enrollees. The barrack leaders also worked as uh, work crew leaders. So an average work crew out in the field was 16 to 18 enrollees, an assistant leader, uh, a leader, and a foreman. And a foreman was uh, one of the uh, 
supervising agency personnel, and he was assisted by a local experienced man. But so far that I know, none of the veteran camps had those local experienced men in them. Yeah. Everyone that's in this structure here, other than the commanding officer, educational advisor, junior officer, and camp surgeon, those four were not veterans. But the majority of the Army officers, that the majority that served in the camps were war vets. Captain Austin at, at Clear Lake, Camp Presque Isle in 1935 was an ex-enlisted man from World War II. He got his commission and was able to keep it at the end of the war. But generally for vets, they wanted combat, you know, war vet officers working because they could relate to them better. A lot of the reserve officers that were worked with the junior companies were younger men. Some of them were pulled out of college. They hadn't finished, given their reserve commissions at 22, and they were running the camps. And they were working with enrollees that were 18 to 25. So they're roughly the same age group. Not always, but that was fairly common. But other than those four men here, uh, assistant educational advisor, exchange steward company, clerk, first aid assistants. Those were all enrollees. And in a veteran camp, these were all veterans. In a junior company, these were men 18 to 25. So a senior leader, that senior leader, the mess steward and supply steward were also senior leaders. They were, that was the equivalent of a company first sergeant. And sometimes you'd have an 18-year-old kid being a company first sergeant in a CCC company. If they, they were given a responsibility, if they showed that they could take on the responsibility, they were given the responsibility, unlike today, where generally people that aren't responsible are given responsibility. Who works at a company like that? I do. Yeah. Pardon me? Oh, that's, I don't understand this. This came out of the National Archives. In Michigan, I only know of one pool that was ever dug by a CCC company, and it was never lined, and it's on the Osable River, and it's up at Camp Hartwick Pines, and it's still there. It's silting over slowly, but you can cross the, the stream there, and you walk right past it. Ask my wife. Are you talking in class? No. Mm -mm. No, that was the basically that would have been where is the exchange steward. That wasn't that was really that person would have been an assistant leader and they would just get somebody to be a barber, uh, pool attendant. No, that's not pool tables because <laughs> every camp didn't have pool tables. What if you, what the enrollees didn't want one? Huh? No, that, that would that would have said mechanic. But that's something that is missing from here, though, is, is a chauffeur. He was titled a chauffeur. And they didn't work. They were, they were part of the company overhead, but they worked even on their off hours for the supervising agency since the Army had no responsibility for the vehicles. So reforestation. This is how they did it, by hand. The planting box they're carrying carries 100 saplings. Now what you see them using right there is this. This is an original. It was adapted in a lot of areas in the nation. This is called the Michigan planting bar. It's a biddle. The technical term for this is a biddle. This is how they planted trees. You carry this in your right hand, 100 seedlings in your left hand, and you took two paces, stop, Put this in the ground, back and forth. Put the seedling in, kicked it in with your heel, pushed it forward with this, took two more steps. If you go up north and you go find those lines of spruce, jack pine, things like that, uh, white pine, red pine, they're going to be two paces apart. And even today when they plant them mechanically, it's, it's still two paces apart because they were planting by hand up, up through the early 60s. And that's how 485 million trees were planted in the nine years of the CCC in Michigan, by hand. Uh, this is the seed beds. These are, these are not the originals, but this is up at, at Higgins Lake. 
they're kind of showing you how it was done. The, the pine cones were dried out there, separated, warmed up and kind of germinated, then planted after, uh, I think it was six months, they were taken out to bigger seed beds using that tool here that you see here. Where's the, there we go. This, they're taken out of the ground and they're placed in this, it opens up. And then they went over to another seedling bed and replanted them and waited till they got to be a 2.0 seedling. 2.0 means it's been in the ground for two years. Six inch root, six inch greenery, that was ready to go out and plant. On average, some of the trees were a little bit undergrowth and they plant them again, it'd be a 2.5 or a 3.0 before they're big enough to be planted. But that's when they talk about planting a seedling, that's what you had, it was about like that. Not very big. And there's another picture. This was taken up in the UP. And I want to point out too, they're not putting that planting bar into hard ground. Like if you went out in the grass here and planted it, the year before, the supervising agency would scope out which areas are going to be worked and planted next year. They go out there with their the camp tractor and a plow and you can see it has furrows just like a cornfield. So the ground was pre-treated, ready for planting each year. That's the bar. Now this is a shorter version of it. I've never seen any other photo of an enrollee getting down his hands and knees like this to put it in the ground. Because that's not the standard way to do it. <laughs> I think this was a posed picture. But that's a typical work crew. It's not the full-size crew. But you'll see, these are the guys planning. This is going to be an assistant leader here. He just has a wooden stick with him. And then this is one of the camp foremen. They tried to average 1,000 trees a day per enrollee. And anyone I hear today complaining of back pain at their work? Uh, hmm? They, th that, was, that was their goal. Their goal was a thousand. They actually had competitions to see which crew did, did the most. You averaged about, company was averaged 200 men and about 175 did forest work. The other 25 stayed in camp. But they didn't just plant trees. Some of them did white pine blister rust repair, which was killing all the pines. It's this I don't know, a spore that comes out. They, they, the original host plant was a current. Then it would just drift in the wind and settle on the white pines and the red pines, and it would kill the trees. And then you have a dead tree standing there. What's a dead tree do? Helps, helps feed a forest fire. So they go out and they use a ribe hook to, to dig out, root out current and, and uh, huckleberry plants. They're actually thinking about having to do that today because eventually they ended up like pouring kerosene on them or a tar on them. And that was bad for nature and everyone made fun of using a ribe hook, but the Forest Service still uses ribe hooks. <laughs> and that's a reproduction planting box. So the other thing I wanted to point it out, each camp normally had at least one tractor, like a John Deere tractor, a big working tractor, um, some had road graders, but not a lot of mechanical equipment. All the work done. When they went down to do some clearing of snags, which are standing dead trees, and clearing underbrush, it was all done by hand with cross-cut saws, axes, shovels, and rakes. And this is at Ludington State Park, and you can see they have a dirt pile, and they're walking up, they're loading a dump truck with dirt by hand. And I think... This series of photos, I got permission to use these from the girl. This is her grandfather's photos. Um, this is when they're still working on the beach house at Ludington. Uh, this is right near where the, the campground is at Ludington. The one up by Hamlin Lake, that was where the CCC camp was. That bridge is no longer there, but that's what they call Lost Lake. Uh, this is Lewiston, never mind that one. This is your average uh, truck that they went out, they 
not only went out to the work site in these trucks, but on the weekends, they'd take them into town in these. So now imagine being up north in the middle of winter in the nearest town it could be 25 to 40 miles away in the cold. And all you had on was a wool Mackinac. <laughs> it got cold in these trucks. And that's, uh, this is Ludington also. This is the best series of work pictures I could find. They're all loading up. They'd stand formation in the morning, have breakfast, and then they'd be sent out to the work. They left at eight o'clock and they were back uh, after by no later than five. They stopped. Their work day was eight to five, technically an hour lunch. So they didn't really work an eight hour day. They, they could drive for almost an hour to get to their work site. And here they are throwing more dirt down into the ground. This is at Ludington also. All done by hand. Now, later on, some of these camps by the late phases of the CCC got a little bit more mechanical equipment because a lot of the other camps were closing. They sold off the surplus material. And then that would get refunded to the CCC fund and they'd buy some more updated mechanically equipment to assist the camps because the camps themselves were not averaging 200 men in the later period. They'd be lucky if they had 150 men. There's wood. And you'll notice uh, this is actually wood being used for the construction of the beach house at Ludington. You notice he's using an ads to square off that timber. Now, some camps uh, like Camp Presqu'ile, when they set up their barracks, they actually sent some of the uh, trees that they cut down to save money from the Army buying the lumber. They cleared out a lot of trees, and they sent it to a sawmill in Atlanta. And it was cheaper than the Army buying it <laughs> and sending the lumber in. But this lumber, they cut down the trees in the park and then sent it to a local mill, which was happy for the job because, remember, these lumber sawmills, weren't getting a lot of timber from the forestry because most of the forestry projects had already shut down. So this, this extended their lives. And that's the beach house. This is, uh, this picture I think was taken in, in 40. And then the last few years, the state spent a couple of million dollars and restored it. And that's what it looks like today. There's nine no, there's 10 CCC structures still at Ludington. It, it has outside of, I think it's Camp Bawabic has a lot of the original structures. Um, uh, Indian Lake, uh, there's two buildings built there. Of course, Kitchi to Kippy, who's ever been there? Kitchi to Kippy, Kitchi to Kippy, however you want to pronounce it. The original raft was built by the CCC there. Uh, but Ludington has probably the most extant ones. Oh yeah, this is shows some modernization. This is one of the few camps that for its entire existence, Camp Germfask up in the Saney Marshes, it actually had a lot of modern construction equipment. The project was so big, they couldn't have done it without it. But they still were doing movement of dirt by wheelbarrow. You think you get anyone to do it today? Not a chance. Supposedly, they're supposed to reinstitute the Civilian Climate Corps. It, it's not going to happen. It's, it's just not going to happen. And there you go. They're wearing the 1935 Mackinac. There's a reproduction over there. Uh, they worked in the winter, not reforesting, but they would go out. It's lumbermen went out in the winter to cut down trees. It was just easier to move them around. And when they went out to clear out, burnt out areas, they would do it in the winter. It's just easier to move around. And when the tree fell, it didn't smash into the dirt. And you had to dig it out. So they worked in the cold weather. That's Camp Ludington. See where the snow is? I think this was taken in uh, 30, February of 36. Michigan had a huge, massive snowstorm that year. Now, that's one of the nine trailside pavilions, comfort stations that were built at Ludington. There's only six left, but I was talking to uh, Alan Werner. He's the uh, camp interpreter there. Um, he knows where the other three are, and he's got a map for me if I ever can get it from him of all the CCC buildings at Ludington. 
I got to get my hands on them. So there it is. This was taken in 1936. That's it today. One of the six that are still there. And out in the woods working, your food was trucked to you. And what's amazing about this is they're eating sandwiches, which means this wasn't a well-run camp. Every camp that I've read of that was served sandwiches out the workforce in the woods ended up having a revolt, and they would replace the mess steward and the cooks because they had the money, they had the allotment to buy. They were supposed to send out a hot-cooked meal to the guys working out in the woods. Now, this is an example of some of the uh, outdoor recreation things that they would build for certain state parks. This was built as a national park project here in Michigan, just west of here. Uh, this is still being operated as a summer camp by the Michigan United Conservation Club. This is uh, the Cedar Lake Outdoor Recreation Center. No, this is, yes, this is Cedar Lake. This is built by the CCC. It has three group campgrounds, a central mess hall, things like that. Uh, group camps B and C have been pretty much completely rebuilt. They don't resemble their original things. This was built by Camp uh, Waterloo. And this is just, like I said, this is outside Chelsea. That's the uh, craft building. These are some of the bunk houses that the uh, campers use every year, different versions of them. These were built by the CCC. That's their mess hall. And that's where the uh, two cooks lived. Now, that's not CCC cooks. That's church groups who go rent the camp for a couple of weeks. That's where their cooks would stay. They'd hire somebody local to do the cooking. These are instructions from the CCC uh, forestry book on how to fight war, uh, forest fires. Things that you needed in order to send men out to fight fires. What kind of food? What kind of shelter? Things like that. Oh, and the CCC allotted a 33% increase in their daily ration of 3,600 calories to anyone fighting a fire. They usually work 20 hours straight fighting a fire before they change shifts. And this is how they fought fires. Pretty much how they still do it today with the jumpers. They go in with shovels and chainsaws. So what they're doing is they're... this. You can easily tell that there wasn't an existing fire break because they've cut down the trees. They're trying to move the trees out. Then they have to go into this area and clear all that underbrush out. And how you get the grasses and the roots out is you use, oh, there they are again. They're getting rakes. That is an existing fire break. But now they're clearing out the, the grasses that have grown there. This is up at um, Isle Royal, a at least a third to almost a half of the island burnt down in 1936. They had 1,000 CCC enrollees fighting this all summer, and they kept a 70-man crew there during the winter. They usually didn't keep the guys there during the winters, but they spent the winter cleaning up some of the mess. Again, it was cold, easier to get the dead trees out. And that's a rich fire rake. Those are still being used. You can see the serrated teeth right there. They're about this wide and that's how you dig it in the soil and it just rips up the roots. And what you're doing now is exposing that dirt. Fire can't spread on the dirt unless you get a fire that jumps over the fire break. That's something else they use. This is called an Indian water can. They still make them, but now they're being used to spread insect spray. But you fill up that tank with, I think it's seven gallons of water and you went out you pump the water and spray it on the fire. Now, where did they get the water? One of the other jobs that the CCC did in Michigan is they do groundwater surveys. So they have a crew of men. They get a, a uh, transit out there. They go with the forestry guys. And they go so far in, they send a drill down. Where's the groundwater? Mark it on a map. Keep going further. Where's the groundwater? Drill down, find it. And they had maps. When they go in to fight a fire, they said, we can drill 15 feet here and hit groundwater, put a gas pump there, pump it up, fill up these, and fill up regular fire hoses to fight the fire. It's just amazing what they did. Now, here's another crew. This is at uh, 
it's and again i'm showing juniors working here because it's the most pictures i can find of actual work crews going out they're going to go out and they're going to clear out some dead dead timber snags and brush and i remember when we laughed at trump for saying they got to go in and rake the forests in california that's what he was talking about was getting in there and clearing out the underbrush because california has not spent money doing that in years a buddy of our Tom Rock's son is a jumper and he hates California because he says we get in there, we have to cut fire breaks because they have they are not doing it there. They're letting the forest grow back wild because that's healthy. And they get a lot of forest fires because of it. Can anyone guess where this was taken? Yeah, that's in Michigan. This is Pontiac. This is Camp Dodge Bloomer. The camp was at um uh Crescent Lake. But again, it shows you the variety of tools that they're using out in the field. Do you see much modern equipment there? Oh, and by the way, keep in mind that the, the chainsaw was invented in the 30s, but the late 30s. And when they made a decent working model by 47, it was 100 pounds. So they didn't really exist for the majority of the CCC. And you can tell they're all happy working out in the mud. <laughs> Now, as far as like the enrollees, what was it like being in, in the CCC? As far as the Army, again, their uniforms were Army provided, their work uniforms, everything was Army provided. This is as close as they got to doing any marching, it was morning and evening, or morning colors and evening retreat. They did not salute. The only person saluting here, I've been arguing with a few other guys nationally about whether they saluted or not. They started teaching the guys the salute after 1940 because they were required to do 10 hours of military training because of what was going on in Europe. Some camps, they actually taught them to salute, but if you ever seen an enrollee, enrollee saluting in any form prior to uh, 1940, is mainly just putting the hand over the heart. Even the veterans did that. Because the only guy you're going to see here in this picture here is the camp commander. He's an army officer. And I don't know where the other army officers are, but they would salute. That's it. They just had to stand at attention while the colors were taken down. And that is the CCC uh, workers statue at Camp Higgins Lake. This is the first one erected anywhere in the United States. This whole program was started by the Alumni Association here in Michigan. Uh, they actually, and the alumni built that barracks. That museum in, at Higgins Lake Nursery is not an original CCC building. It was built by the veteran enrollees, or the, uh, the alumni enrollees. But it's a standard 80 by 20 foot barracks. Oh, by the way, if you want to buy one of those statues and donate it to a park, they're, they're $22,000. Down from the original cost of $33,000. That's the standard dress uniform where they, when they when they came back from the work sites they were wearing their denims but they had to change into the wool uniform summer and winter with a tie they weren't allowed into the mess hall for supper at night wearing denims you had to wear your dress uniform so with this you just throw in a, a black tie and those pants were made specifically for the only time the army got these was in 42 and they shut it down they gave them they're an extra thick 1934 style pair of army pants. They're very heavy. And that's it for those pictures, I believe. Oh, sorry. They all had uh, pets, mascots of some kind. That's a junior enrollee camp here. But the 1670th company had Bucky. I have 11 of their camp newspapers. They're digital copies I printed out. And Bucky's mentioned in at least three articles. They built a, a fenced-in area for him during hunting season to protect them. But Bucky apparently was there. He kept coming back to the camp for about two years. And when I mentioned the stone pathways where you can still see some of the stones at Higgins Lake, you can see that here. Some of those are still there. And this, the lake's that side, behind that barracks. And yes, they still augmented their tractors. If they needed some more plowing done, things like that, they, they brought in animals for that. 
My wife's tired of me talking, I can see. Don't hide it, Lori. Why is this not advancing? No? I don't know. It's different from mine at home. Yeah. Is it the last one? Okay. So I just gonna so my my wife will give me more looks here. Um, give a synopsis here. This is a uh, inspection report from Camp Presque Isle in 1937. I'm trying to find where they tell you how much territory. The maximum working radius uh, in the past has been uh, 25 miles. And they did the majority of their work within 12 miles of the camp. But they also built the Hillman Airport that's still being used today. And that's, I don't know how many miles, it's like 30 miles, 30, 40 miles from Camp Presque Isle. Uh, they did a, just a tremendous amount of work there. And one of the things that I came across was they worked on Fletcher State Park. Anyone ever hear of that? Um, the guy up the camp, uh, park superintendent at Clear Lake never heard of Fletcher State Park because it's not a state park anymore. It's, it's a county park outside of uh, Rogers City. Um, I got a hold of the uh, stewardship office in Lansing for the DNR. The, Lisa Gamera there gave me a lot of information. She gave me a whole history of Fletcher State Park built by the veterans of Company 1670 as a state park. There's a couple of buildings that they built there, still there. It's not as big as it used to be, and it's a county park now. The state said, we're not going to keep operating state parks that are, you know, five square miles. It's just not worth our time. We can't afford to do that. So they turned a lot of the, these smaller projects that a lot of these uh, camps worked on over to local authorities. I thought that was kind of interesting. It's, and I, I know the current um, state historian for the Northern Lower Peninsula that runs the museum that I, I also know the guy that did it before her and they both were stumped when I mentioned Fletcher Park and it's not that far from Atlanta in Onaway, but they'd never heard of it. So most of these camps lasted at least through 39, uh, two of them, Camp Vanderbilt and uh, the 1670th company, uh, they ended up at uh, the Higgins Lake camp. Uh, again, because they were closing all the junior camps. They're the two that I can document that lasted the full nine years. Uh, the company up at uh, Black Lake, uh, which is actually on Aquiac Lake, to confuse you more. Yeah, it's, it's, and they built the Onaway State Park, which was 17 miles from Clear Lake State Park, which was where Camp Presque Isle was. You think they would have sent guys. They didn't. Uh, Black like did. They shut down in 36 and the 16th, 1671st company shut down in 1935. So those are the two companies I know that shut down fairly early. The other camps, I still, I'm waiting for information on that. That's why I wish I had all that documentation. I can go into more detail. But if you go to Pigeon River Country, the headquarters area, the maintenance barn, the uh, discovery center, the visitor center is built like it was originally, but that burnt down in the 70s and the park wanted to build a concrete structure and the locals said, no, you're going to rebuild it the way it was originally. So at least it looks like it. Those buildings were all built by the veterans at uh, Pigeon River, uh, but is Pickerel Lake on the west side of, the, of uh, Pigeon River Country State Forest was built by uh, Camp Vanderbilt and all the stone structures there were built by veterans also. It's like that area is very heavy with uh, veteran camp work being done. So does anybody have any questions? When you were talking about the, um, what happened after they, they segregated? They went to what were called colored companies. Oh yeah, we had color, yeah. Yeah, Mac Lake, Bitely. Oh, okay. uh, they're all black. They're all black. Even, uh, even the, uh, Camp officers were white. Up. 
Okay, that's what I wanted. To Camp officers out. were white. Generally, in more in the northern areas, uh, the educational assistant, they try to hire a black teacher. Uh, the chaplains would be black chaplains. Um, but all the, you know, the senior leader, the mess steward, they were all blacks. Uh, there's a few cases after 39 that I can think of where they did have some army officers, black army officers, uh, work camp officers. It wasn't common, but I can't document that here in Michigan. Right. Okay. But we had camps that were integrated at least through the summer of 1935. You touched on the officers that were working there, with the reserve officers, and the, and the thing is, a lot of them, yeah. you know, they graduated college, they were 22, just out, they couldn't get jobs either. So when the Army said, hey, you can go on active duty for a year, that was money. So they were all, you know, and it's hard to concept, you know, to everybody was out of work. Yeah. And educated, not educated, and Army officers, reserve Army officers, so they jumped at the chance to to get a full paying job with, with, with little benefits right. and all that, and then, and then get the, you know, the experience. You know. Yeah. And then, like you said, it wasn't meant to be a, a military organization, but what happened in 1942? Those, all those kids yeah. were in the military. Yeah. 80% 80, 80 of the men that served in the CCC went to war. Um, generally, when you got recruited, you got sent to a division for training, that two-year training cycle. They had a cadre of experienced sergeants and corporals, but they needed a lot more. Were you an Eagle Scout? You're a corporal, acting corporal now. Oh, wait, you were in the CCC? You were a senior leader in the CCC? You're a sergeant. You were a leader in the CCC? You're a corporal. Boom, just like that. Because they knew that these men knew how to work with others of different backgrounds to get a job done. And you understood basic discipline, and you also knew how to run a barracks. You could teach guys how to make their bunks, how to shave themselves, how to keep clean. You're not showering today. You're getting in there and taking a shower, buddy. You know, uh, that's interesting. Each camp, you know, they they put in their own water supply if they didn't weren't near a town. Like Camp Wayne, they just piped water in from Detroit, right? And electricity came. A lot of these set up their own generating plants, their own steam power plants, things like that. But the, each barracks didn't have their own bathroom. They had one building that had showers on this side, sinks and toilets on the other. <laughs> and they were heated. Like I said, they were heated year round, hot water, things like that. No other questions? No? Do you want to take a look around? I have a footlocker. Many of the items up there are original. There's a few that are reproduction. I'm sorry, I'm part of here. The big goal was to do a thousand a day because you could boast about it. So you're figuring eight to nine hundred trees a day. Each person. Each person. 16 to 18 man crew going across the field. You're little, the little sapling. Start out. Yeah, one, two, boom, boom. Sampling, came in, push it in. One, two. And you did that all day. For at least seven hours. But if you didn't like doing that, you put in a request. I want to go on the bridge crew. And you build bridges or culverts or the road crew. Right? You could go, I want to work on the blister con blister rust control team. Well, then what you're doing is you're bending over even more, getting into pricker bushes with a hook, digging up roots. Which, which job do you want to do? A lot of them actually wanted KP because they sat in, the, <laughs> in camp all day and they could snick snack. The other thing you got to remember that these young junior companies, these were young guys, right? And, and a lot of them went from the city. Yeah. Detroit, 
40% of the enrollees across the entire court were city dwellers. 60% were from the country. They didn't know anything about the woods. They didn't know that the woods like kids do not like They didn't have transportation. They didn't have to drive. It wasn't something that no. schools taught or anything like that. So the teachers could teach about them. Taught them how to work on vehicles, which here you could the city did work on that and work on. The problem was, like what Phil said, these kids were getting in trouble because they had no jobs. Well, not all of them. And they were, they were rolling in the pockets. So they were rolling town to town. It started to grow a problem. And it wasn't like the army. When you volunteer to join, you had to volunteer. You had to be on some type of welfare, right? Uh, you only serve for six months, and then you can re-enroll. And initially, the program was only designed to last six months. They saw how good it was working. They extended it, right? And then 1935 came and Congress couldn't pass a vote and they kept the camps operating. Everyone volunteered to stay in the camps, hoping that they'd extend it a couple of more years, but they didn't get money for a month, <laughs> right? But they had enough in company funds to make sure food was coming in. Not only in 35 did they extend it a couple of more years, they also increased it to 500,000 men. So it ran at a half a million men for from 35 to 36. That's pretty big. Remember, the U.S. Army was minuscule compared to that. Now, you, ex you could extend up to two years, so four, four enrollments. So you could do, in theory, two years. But if you are a leader, an assistant leader, a leader, or a senior leader, if your company commander really liked you and you're doing a good job, they'd extend you indefinitely. That's a junior company. V uh, veteran companies, there was no limit on enrollments. In 1936, 1936, um, the guys up at Presque Isle, uh, the original 200 men, I think there are still 40 originals left. Um, three years later, they stayed in camp. And in 1937, I think the same company had five guys that were with the company when they first were created in Yeah. Yeah, as I was, was mentioning. Pardon me? Yes, they're still standing. Yeah, uh, some of them have been tor torn down. And again, going back to Lisa Gamera, who's now retired from the state uh, DNR Stewardships Department, her job was to tell these camps, state park guys. And the tendency now with the younger park superintendents, this is talking from people with the Michigan DNR. They don't like the younger people. The younger people don't care about their park's history. And these are the people that are now running these state parks. They don't care about the history, and they don't care if something was built by the CCC. It's a shame. But her job was to say, you cannot tear that building down. That's why I'm saying Camp Ludington down in the Lower Peninsula and Bawabic up in the UP are probably the two best examples of a state park campground built by the CCC, because it still has many of the original structures still there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's... The legacy is actually building a list of CCC built state park cabins that you can still rent today. Go to Starved Rock in Illinois. That big lodge and all the cabins that you can stay in, they were all built by two CCC companies. Have you ever been to the Grand Canyon? Yeah, Grand Canyon. That was 
another thing that they did was go out there and take part in the They allowed people then, after the war, because they all kind of got stuck after the war, but these young kids now, after they got out of the war, or they got married and had families in the 50s, they were able to take their kids to these sites that were not acceptable to them prior to the siege of the Now they are. They were then, and they still, as you say, are still using these facilities, still able to you know, yeah. enjoy our, our resources. And remember, a lot of these veterans that planted trees, the average veteran was 45 to 55. That was the average age. But they had guys in their early 60s. Remember, before you would even really notice the growth of the trees, it takes about 20 years. Some of those guys were dead before their trees reached a mature lumbering. 20 years is what we cut down trees at now. You got to remember, this whole reforestation wasn't just to make the forest beautiful again. It was made so you could cut the trees down and use it for lumber, but you could go back and replant it. And that's the one good thing. The problem now with modern lumber is it's usually 20 years old. So the grains aren't as tight. It's not like old growth timber. You look at a, a two by four made in, you know, in a house that was built in 1920, the, the grains are much, much tighter. But that was the whole thing was, it wasn't just to make the forest beautiful. It was for future lumbering, Right. So, oh, the government's selling off these trees. Well, yeah, that's the whole idea. Right. <laughs> People don't get this with why. Why is the government selling off trees? That, that was the whole reason for this. The other thing you have to keep in mind is if you didn't go in and replant. You ever see the Dust Bowl? That's because they overplanted certain crops that had very short root structures. Corn has a root structure about this deep, whereas the native prairie grasses had six foot roots. The CCC built a 30 mile wide belt of trees from the Texas Panhandle all the way up to Canada. That was one big windbreak, but it would take 20 years to really get it fully functioning because of the growth. So there's a lot of reasons why a program like this is very important. They kept trying to get it passed as a permanent structure. But even today though, there's, there, I'll tell you right now, you're not going to get a kid between 18 and 30 to live in a camp and live under army rules, not but not the army, live in a camp, get fed in a camp, and have to do manual labor. But each state has a youth conservation corps. Michigan had one. They built the, the Riverhawk Lodge at, at uh, Proud Lake. But they only had like 20 kids there. They had one up at uh, Higgins Lake that worked at the sign shop at Hartwood Pines, and they had one up in the UP. Maybe 20 kids. That lasted a few years, and that was it. But they did their own cooking. They had their own cars. They could go home on the weekends. You know, no, no, no. And that's another reason why you talk to guys that went to the CCC in World War II and just about every vet I know today, you're changed by it. You're taught responsibility. Not every vet, but they learned a lot about life. And younger generations now are not going to put up with the, the rigidity and the discipline needed to do this kind of work. Work out in the woods for how much? They're not going to like it. All right. Okay. Again, you're invited to come on over and take a look at these.